Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get dad for Father's Day? You should check out Row One Brand's Vintage Pictorum Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for dad this Father's Day. Instead of a boring old tie, get him a historic baseball photo taken by Henry High Sandum at the historic Polo Ground Stadium in New York City during the 1894 Temple Cup. Or, if he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 vintage NFL poster. These are so good looking that you'll be amazed how they turn out. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one and save 15% off your order. This is Basketball History 101 with Rick Loiza. Welcome back to Basketball History 101, part of the Sports History Network. I am your host, Rick Loiza, and this is the podcast where we bring to life some of the forgotten stories from basketball history. And today we bring you the story of a game that nobody saw. Technically, a couple of people saw it. One was a six-year-old daughter of one of the head coaches, and the other was a college student who climbed up a wall and looked in through the window and saw part of the second half. But the game was meant to be a secret. Nobody was ever to know the game ever took place. So why all the secrecy? What was it about this game that the participants were sworn to never tell anybody about? The way that I am making it sound, you are probably thinking that this was some game between international spies with the fate of the world at hand. Well, there was not quite that much on the line. But in a very real sense, some of the participants could have been arrested for participating in this basketball game. At the very least, they could have been fined. So what was the big deal? Like most of the stories that I cover here, context is vitally important to understanding the magnitude of what was happening. The year was 1944, and the location was the city of Durham, North Carolina. The world was still in the depths of World War II. The famous D-Day invasion of Normandy by the Allied forces was still three months away. In Durham, North Carolina, as in the rest of the state, segregation was still the law of the land. This was a time when there were still separate bathrooms, separate drinking fountains, separate restaurants and movie theaters. The part that really has an impact on today's story is that there were still separate colleges for black and white students. In North Carolina, it was against the law for a basketball team from a black college to play a game against a team from a white college. That is the heart of our story today, an illegal game between a team of white medical students from Duke University and the regular varsity team from North Carolina College. Both schools are located less than three miles from each other in Durham, North Carolina. At the time, the full name of North Carolina College was the North Carolina College for Negroes. Today, the school is known as just North Carolina College, and for most of this episode, I will refer to the school by its initials, NCC. But who were these teams, and how was it that they ended up in a gym together behind locked doors? Well, let's start with NCC. Their head coach was a man named John McClendon. He attended the University of Kansas, where he was a student of James Naismith, the inventor of the game. McClendon was not allowed to play on the basketball team at Kansas because of segregation rules in place at the time, but he got to know Naismith quite well, often dining at the Naismith home just to talk about basketball and life. Naismith even helped McClendon to find teaching and coaching jobs. Naismith was very involved in the professional development of John McClendon. It was during this time that McClendon hung around the basketball team at Kansas. He began to develop an idea for a fast break style of basketball, which was revolutionary at the time. Relatively few teams would try the fast break at the time. Most teams built their entire game around a methodical, slow down half court offense. But McClendon figured that if he could somehow build a team with fast players, they could outrun the opponent and overwhelm them with easy baskets. At the time that our game took place, Coach McClendon was only 28 years old, barely older than some of his own players. We do not know a lot about his players, just some names and a few details. At point guard, he had Aubrey Stanley, who grew up on the coast in rural North Carolina, and at the time, Durham was the biggest city he had ever seen. He was lightning quick with a solid jump shot. He also had Henry Big Dog Thomas, who was 24 years old, and he dominated the inside with rebounding and low post scoring. There was also George Parks, James Boogie Hardy, and Floyd Brown. On the bench, he had Anthony Smokey Davis, Billy Williams, and George Samuel, who were local players. Coach McClendon coached these players to be the most efficient fast break team basketball had ever seen up to that point. 
He conditioned them relentlessly so that they could play 40-minute basketball games at full speed. McClendon had a master's degree in kinesiology and had developed some theories about conditioning and training that he tried with the NCC team. And it worked. During the season of 1943 and 1944, the Eagles of NCC dominated everyone they played. The pace they played at was unforgiving. Many of you probably remember the 7 seconds or less offense of the Phoenix Suns from 2004 to 2012. That was a team led by point guard Steve Nash, coach Mike D'Antoni, along with Amari Stoudemire, Sean Marion, and Joe Johnson. At the time, it was the fastest offense the NBA had seen. Well, they had nothing on NCC. Back in 1944, Coach McClendon had something he called the lightning break, which was designed to get a shot in four seconds or less of taking possession of the ball. That's right, four seconds or less. Other teams just could not keep up. NCC was winning games by 40 and 50 points regularly. During the season, they had beat St. Augustine 119 to 34, which got them some national exposure. Another opponent, Shaw University, purposely waxed their court with an extra thick coat of wax. Shaw then practiced for a week on the slippery court just to get used to it. Their thought was to eliminate NCC's fast break by purposely making the court slippery. It worked for the first half. Shaw had the lead going into halftime. NCC had no idea what to do, but then Coach McClendon had an idea. He talked to the referees at halftime to confirm that there was no rule that required players to wear shoes during the game. So, NCC came out for the second half barefoot. Shaw protested, but the referees were clear about the rules. With bare feet, NCC now had traction on the floor again, and they blew out Shaw and won the game 87-44. to NCC was unstoppable as long as the game was being played fairly. The NCC Eagles won their conference and were invited to the National Negro College Basketball Championship, which was also known as the Black NIT. The best historical black colleges and university teams were invited to this tournament. One of the favorites, other than NCC, was Lincoln University from Pennsylvania. The tournament was held at the Renaissance Ballroom and Casino in Harlem, New York. You might remember the name of that ballroom because it served as the home floor for the famous New York Rens basketball team that barnstormed the country from the 1920s to the very early 1950s. If you want to hear that story, go all the way back to episode 2. Harlem was the capital of African American culture and an appropriate place to stage this tournament. As most people expected, the championship game came down to NCC and Lincoln. As the game began, NCC was simply off its game. They fell behind early and just did not look like themselves. They were allowing easy baskets and were getting mixed up on their defensive assignments. Lincoln was leading at halftime. Now the second half was much better for NCC as they seemed to find their footing and they began to close the lead. They had the momentum all going their way. They climbed back from 11 down and were now only 3 points behind with just a couple of minutes left. Coach McClendon felt that the game was theirs. And then, very suddenly, the head referee called the end of the game. There was no official game clock for this tournament. The head referee was keeping time on his watch. The referee had simply announced that the time had run out and Lincoln was declared the winner of the tournament. Coach McClendon was throwing a fit. He had an assistant keeping track of the time on his own watch and they had at least four minutes left in the game. But the referee disagreed and that was it. That is when McClendon noticed something peculiar happening off the court. The known sports gamblers of Harlem were standing around the edges of the court and smiling to each other. That is when he realized that the game was fixed. The head referee was being paid to stop the game before NCC could retake the lead. The gamblers had bet big on Lincoln and they made sure that Lincoln won the game. It was a sad ending to the season. They knew that no team had beaten them fairly. It took bribery to ensure an NCC loss, but that is how it went. While that was the end of the formal season for NCC, it is not the end of our story. Now this is a good place to take a break, and I'll be right back with the Duke team and share some of their story. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Welcome back to the show, and let's continue on. We just covered NCC and their incredible season that ended with the championship for black teams being fixed against them. 
Meanwhile, on the other side of Durham, a basketball team at Duke was also tearing up the competition. But this was not the regular varsity team from Duke. This was a team made up of graduate students who were all studying at Duke Medical School. The players were mostly former Division I college players who all ended up at Duke to get their medical degrees. So technically, they were a team made up of regular students. None of them were on athletic scholarships. And they were tearing up the intramural league at Duke. In case anyone was wondering, intramural sports are common at most colleges and universities. They are basically just teams made up of regular students who play against each other for a school championship. The players from the regular varsity were not allowed to play on an intramural team, but most students that play on these teams are former high school athletes who are now just regular students and they just want a chance to continue playing and win a school title. Now this is essentially what this Duke team was. They were just an intramural team made up of medical students, again many of whom had played Division I basketball when they were undergrads. So they could really play. In fact, the regular Duke varsity was one of the best teams in the country that year. They won their conference. So the regular Duke varsity played against this team of medical students and the medical students dominated the game. So here was one of the top college teams in the country and they just got destroyed by a team made up of doctors or would be doctors. That is how good this team of medical students was. Since there was no team on campus that could touch them, they sought out games against local AAU teams and even semi-professional teams just to find some good competition. And they were doing all of this while trying to complete an accelerated medical program. Remember, this was still during the middle of World War II. Duke University, in conjunction with the US Army, decided to pick up the pace of their medical studies and made them study year round so they could earn their degrees more quickly and join the war effort. Basically, the army needed doctors, so they were rushing these students through so that they could help patch together soldiers in the war. Here are a few of the names on that Duke team of medical students. David Hubble, team captain and a great player from a very wealthy family. Dick Thistlewaite, who was solid outside shooter and played his basketball at Richmond University. Dick Simmons, who played at Central College in Missouri. Joe Walthall played at West Virginia University and had won an NIT championship a couple of years earlier. Lloyd Taylor had played his college ball at Maryville College in Tennessee. Ed Johnson played at Phillips University in Oklahoma. Homer Sieber and Harry Wexler were simply above average players who had not played since high school but were still good players. But their best player was Jack Burgess who had played at the University of Montana. So here you have these two teams just three miles apart. Both are destroying their competition but legally were not allowed to play each other. Which was a real shame. And I am a pretty competitive person and I am the kind of person who wants to see the best teams play against the other best teams regardless of what sport it is. So, while both teams were wrapping up their seasons, at the same time, a group of students from NCC and Duke were meeting together regularly to discuss war, politics, and race relations in the South. The host of these meetings was Ernst Manasse, a white Jewish professor at NCC. He had escaped Nazi Germany in the mid-1930s, and he made his way to the United States and found a teaching job at NCC, where he taught Latin and philosophy. Having seen what was happening in Germany with his own eyes, he felt it was important to bring black students from NCC and white students from Duke together to find common ground and establish friendships. Their meeting was beginning to have a very positive impact because one day the Ku Klux Klan showed up at the door and told the wife Mary Ann that they needed to stop having these meetings or else. One of the things that came out of these meetings was a lot of bragging about which school had the better basketball team. The NCC students were very confident that their team was the best in Durham. In fact, one of the best in the country. The students from Duke felt the same way about their medical student team. So this is how the idea of the game was born. Some of the NCC students went to Coach McClendon and brought up the idea of having NCC play the Duke medical team. They all knew that it would be illegal to play such a game. Therefore, nobody could know about this game except for the teams involved. At the same time, the Duke students approached the medical students and asked if they would be up for such a game, and they were up for it, but they also understood the need for secrecy. While technically this game was illegal for all players involved, there was really no risk for the white players, and they knew it. If caught, they would be let go with a warning, but for the black players, it could result in a fine or even jail time. So everyone involved kept the game as a secret. They decided to have the game on Sunday morning, March 19th, 1944. The reason that they picked Sunday morning was that it was the South, and over 90% of the town would be in church, reducing the risk that anyone would find out about the game. 
So, the medical students from Duke got up early and prepared to head over to NCC where the game was going to be played. But first, they stopped at Camp Butner where they had a military hospital. The students did their rounds and checked on their patients. Not only did the patients need to be checked on, but it was a great cover for why they all had to get in a single car and leave the Duke campus together. From Camp Butner, they arrived at NCC and they parked the car right next to the gym, where Coach McClendon was holding a clipboard and waiting for them. Even the NCC campus was empty, as students were also at church. Nobody saw them arrive, and in retrospect, they should have taken a different car. Dave Hubble drove and used his own car, and this was the player, if you remember, that I mentioned is from a very wealthy family. And he owned a very nice car nicer than anybody else on the NCC campus, and the car looked out of place. But with that, they all went into the gym and found the locker room. Both teams changed and took to the court. The only people inside the gym were the players from both teams, a scorekeeper, one referee, Coach McClendon, and McClendon's six-year-old daughter. They lined up for the opening tip and off they went. Now, not a lot is known about the actual game outside of the final score. Because of the secrecy, they never intended on keeping a proper box score. The scorekeeper only kept track of the overall score, not which players were actually doing the scoring. I also want to tell you that the game came down to the wire, but it did not. The NCC players had their way with the medical students from Duke, and NCC won the game 88-44. They completely ran Duke off the floor, but it answered one of the main questions for Coach McClendon. How would the team perform against a white team, especially a top white team? And it turned out that they did just fine. After the game was done, the team shook hands and then one of the Duke players said, Anybody want to play again? Except this time they would not play as NCC versus Duke. They decided to mix up the players for the second game and then just play for fun. First team to 20 points would win the game. They played for the love of the game. It must have been an awesome sight to behold. I wish I could have been there. Both teams made up of players from NCC and Duke and they were just playing basketball because they loved to play basketball. At this point, some of the students from the NCC were returning to campus after church and noticed that something was going on in the gym, but the doors were locked. One student climbed up to a window and saw the NCC team playing with a bunch of white players. The student happened to work for the school newspaper, and he wanted to write a story about the game so badly, but realized that publishing the story could get the players in trouble with the law, so it never made it into the paper. Once basketball was done for the day, the NCC players invited the Duke players for a reception of punch and cookies. It was a great day as the Duke players were warmly received by the NCC students. The Duke players were having such a good time that they stayed the entire day. From that day on, there was an open invitation from NCC to any Duke student who wanted to find a good pickup basketball game. Duke students were welcomed at NCC, and it was a great day all around. The Duke team would not play together after that. They all would graduate and head off to work at different hospitals, both military and non-military. David Hubble became a renowned thoracic surgeon in Florida. Dick Simmons became a leading expert in abdominal surgery. Dick Thistlewaite once operated on former First Lady Betty Ford. Jack Burgess returned to Montana where he ran a general medical practice and always rooted for his Duke Blue Devils. For the most part, the NCC team broke up after that season as well, as some of the players dropped out of school, some joined the military, and others simply went on to pursue other goals. Coach McClendon eventually moved on to become the head coach at Tennessee State University and become the first black head coach to win an integrated national championship when his team won the 1957 NAIA tournament against white teams. He proved himself as a coach and would later move on to Cleveland State University where he would become the first black coach at a white school anywhere in the country. He also coached the Denver Nuggets when they were still in the ABA during the late 1960s. In 1984, when Georgetown University won the NCAA championship, the reporter asked Coach John Thompson how it felt to become the first black head coach to win a national championship. And he said, quote, I don't know. You need to ask John McClendon, unquote. Their point guard, Aubrey Stanley, got married and carved out a decent life in New York City. It was a completely different life than the one he grew up in in rural North Carolina. Henry Big Dog Thomas decided that it was also time to leave NCC without having graduated. But before he left, he found a can of paint and walked over to the main entrance to make an update to the official school name. Remember, at the time, the school was still called the North Carolina College for Negroes but he painted over the last two words so that it simply said North Carolina College, which is its official name today. Well, that is our story. 
the game that nobody saw. I have to give a shout out to author Scott Ellsworth. His book, The Secret Game, was one of my primary resources for the research on this story. So if you ever see that book, go ahead and pick it up for a more detailed account of this story. So join us next week as we profile the career of George Mikan, the greatest player of the first half of the 20th century. That's next time on Basketball History 101, part of the Sports History Network, the headquarters of Sports History Year. Go to sportshistorynetwork.com to find out more about this and other sports history podcasts. If you like what you hear, please hit that subscribe button wherever you get your podcasts and check out our page on Facebook. It's called Basketball History 101 Podcast. There you will find shorter historical posts as well as discussion starters on today's game. I'll also announce there when new episodes come out. I want to thank my producer and editor, Jacob Loiza. Join us each week as we continue to mine the history of basketball for more great stories from the past. Take care and see you soon. We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories, and Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.